Uh, welcome to the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam. I'm Norm. Hi, I'm Allie. And I Allie Ward. To I know I forgot to prepare something and I just <laughs> blinked. This is like when you uh, have a nightmare about a test you didn't prepare for and you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot to prepare something. Do yeah. I need to go back? No. Oh my gosh, my no, brain, Allie, you guys. Uh, so for, for listeners who don't know Allie Ward, you should be listening <laughs> to her podcast even before mine. Ologies, it is so amazing. It is a deep dive into a million different disciplines with, it's what do you call it? Smart questions, dumb questions for smart people. Yes, yes. I ask smart smart people, not smart questions. And uh, right before I jumped on this, I also mentioned that I was up until four working on it. And my brain is complete oatmeal today. <laughs> so you're going to get a lot of not smart questions. You, are, you. Uh, you and I were put together as a pair of science communicators for a, for a GE job a few years I ago, know. traveling oh. around the world, getting in helicopters and visiting I stations. I know we were, um, we, we got to go to Germany and uh, Copenhagen. Yeah. We boarded helicopters. And I remember the day that we were first supposed to meet, um, and I was so nervous and, uh, I got all dressed up and, uh, and I thought we were, I thought I was like having a, a meeting in person and, uh, and it turned out that it, everyone was just on screens and I was like, oh, I could have not washed my hair. But I was like so <laughs> nervous. <laughs> I was like trying, I was like trying not to visibly sweat, like on a, on a teleconference call. I was so excited to meet you. So yeah, I'm just, what can I say? Brain, mush, war. Super That's fun me. shoot. And I, I, I the, us science communicators have to stick together. There's not enough of us and the world needs more of us right now. I know, I know. It needs more um, very enthusiastic dorks, which is what both of us are. <laughs> well, and look, the, the sort of, uh, the underlying theme to me of this podcast is about inspiration, about where we find inspiration. And one of the things that I have long said that ologies is the perfect um, uh, encapsulation of is everybody you interview on your show is so freaking excited about the knees of fruit flies or the lungs of some weird rodent. And I have never met a scientist who didn't love their work. Have you? Yeah. I mean, you, that's the secret about, that's kind of the secret about scientists is you expect them all to be really like sterile and like the uh, if you look at the back legs of a toad, but really the reason why they got into their niche is because they love it. There's something that just like sparks some sort of enthusiasm. And so yeah, a lot of them are just really passionate uh, dorks and nerds that just love something specific. Like I just I saw a dolphin video when I was a kid, and now I'm a dolphin scientist because some of science is like it's kind of dirty and thankless, and um, you know, but when you love what you do, like that's what kind of keeps you passionate about it. So yeah, that's kind of the, yeah, that's the secret is that they're, they're really, really enthusiastic about it. So I, I'm curious when you're interviewing people on the show, do you, do you find that there's sometimes uh, you have to get past their own uh, assumption that you don't know what their discipline's about or <laughs> they kind of see that you've got the same nerdy passion that they do and they kind of wake up a little bit. Do you find that happens? Oh man, you know, that's such a good question because there's always a spot in an interview where things take a turn and they can go like, you know, they can go either direction. Like you can ask a question that someone does not want to be asked or is like, well, actually. Um, but I, I always love when it's starting off like a little bit sterile, like a little bit, they're used to publishing papers and having to speak academically to people right. who are judging them. And they're used to speaking in like an echo chamber of academia. And then when you can ask a question where they all of a sudden become a person and not uh, a professor is always so wonderful. And it's, you know, usually like, you know, did you get a microscope as a kid or, or is there a movie that has something to do with your discipline that you hate or love? And then before you know it, they're just like someone kicking back being like, oh man, volcano, number one. <laughs> <laughs> and so you just get them to crack open and, and, um, and that to me, I mean, behind all of it is I just want to be friends with all these people. So this is just a right. desperate like, way for me to try to befriend more nerds. <laughs> I am so sure that the most constant question you get is, what's your favorite episode or what's the favorite oh. ology you've investigated? But I'm also as positive that it's probably the most recent one you just did. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Behind me, there's like a board of all the ones coming up. Um, 
The one that I'm working on right now is about um, indigenous fashionology, and it's about um, the fashion world and about um, indigenous clothing. And it's just a bunch of history. And uh, it's also obviously someone who's really, really passionate about that because they're indigenous. And so, um, right. and so, yeah, it, and you know, but sometimes it can be something that's a, a super goofy discipline or, um, yeah, but I get so immersed in each episode and it's really hard for me to phone it in. And so I feel like there's one day a week where I am definitely falling asleep on my laptop because I just like, I don't want to do a bad job on any episode because yeah. it's, I, I'd always sucks, always sucks me in, but yeah, but I will say a fan favorite is chiropterology probably about bats with someone by the name of Dr. Merlin Tuttle, who is like, Tuttle. if you're, yeah, Tuttle, Dr. Merlin Tuttle, <coughs> I low-key just like peeked out behind bushes, you know, in a metaphorical sense, wanting to befriend this guy. And he is a bat expert. He has a big push broom mustache and like he has been, on the he has been a champion of bats like since the 70s and i wanted to meet him so bad before i even started ologies i was like oh wow i gotta meet this dude and so yeah meeting him we sat we talked for like three hours i'm just getting a tea delivery from my uh my show editor also <laughs> my boyfriend <laughs> hi jerry um, I have two show editors and one of them I've been quarantined with since March. It's working out well. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so Merlin Tuttle, you, you know, you want to, you sit down and you talk to someone about bats and then it turns out they have all these stories about getting, you know, stuck in a shaft of a cave and oh. all these adventures. And so, yeah, that's a, that's someone that I really wanted to meet so bad. So yeah, he's amazing. I, I found regularly on Mythbusters when I had to call experts, I would sort of plan what the question line I wanted to ask them. Invariably, I would be like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them this even though I know it's low-hanging fruit, only to hear first a little bit of annoyance <laughs> at the low-hanging fruit question. <laughs> <laughs> then I would often, my like follow-up would be such a misguided attempt to encapsulate their field that I'd hear again that like <laughs> constriction. I'm sure you had to deal with this. <laughs> oh yeah. When you try to summarize something they've said and you get it a little bit wrong, that's always so embarrassing. So I, you know what? I remember when I was like a little kid, I loved reading Rainbow. Um, I love LeVar Burton. And I actually, someone I follow on Twitter rec kind of suggested LeVar Burton as maybe a new host of Jeopardy. And yeah. oh I my mean, gosh, yes. I mean, I think that Alex obviously like gaping hole in our souls where Alex Alex Trebek's daily presence was. But um, but he he Alex Trebek made a statement about whoever follows in his footsteps he, he hopes is is well received. And someone recommended LeVar Burton. I was like, he would be Dude, amazing. He could amazing. be both as sweet and engaging and avuncular, yes. but also as cutting and kind of biggie mm -hmm. yes he could do right? both i, I know, know bar a little bit he's he's got he, he's he's ready to play <laughs> and he's someone who i feel like is has been like a, a presence in our lives for curiosity and like shameless um it like inquisitiveness so i don't know i'm just putting it out there um just just saying david uh david attenborough on on Twitter, who I follow, who's recommended him. But yeah, so I remember watching Reading Rainbow, and I remember LeVar Burton was was learning how a hot air balloons work, and he was in this field of hot air balloons, and he asked, why do you need a flame on this to make it rise? And I remember, like, I was probably seven, being like, LeVar, you know that. Why are you asking these questions? <laughs> you know that's heating the air. And I, and I, maybe I said something to my sister or something, but, um, the realization that, oh, he knows, but he's asking on our behalf. I remember <laughs> being like, that's so nice of Lavar to <laughs> go out on a limb and be judged for a question that is a little bit simple because we might need to know. And so I remember always thinking like, um, you know, those people in class that would ask a question and you'd be like, oh, thank God someone asked that. Because I was wondering the same thing. I always feel like as a science communicator, it is kind of our job to ask the questions that are on our minds or that you think maybe everyone else is thinking. And so you have to, you have to risk that, you know? Yeah. 
But But it's hard to get to that. Sometimes it's very hard for me to just get to even that most obvious question because I've filtered past it to try and be (laughs) To try to sound smart. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. That's like if you're trying to ask questions to impress the scientist, chances are you will most likely fail. But if you ask something super simple, that's when I feel like I usually get the, that's actually a really good question. And you're like... Yes. I feel like that is the kibble that I live off of. That is like the dog treat that I live off of are those little morsels of, that's a really good question. And I'm like, oh, thank you. (laughs) I actually, as a side note, I'll tell you when you, when you do guest slots on network television and the Uh the network news person on GMA or whatever it is, asks you a question, you say, that's a really good question. They light up like Christmas trees. (laughs) Secret tip. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or it's a use. It's how an interviewee can use to fill time too. Yeah. Right? So you're feeding the interviewer a little bit of yeah, and then yeah, yeah, exactly. As we think of oh, what's the answer to that? But um, yeah, you know, when I was first started making ologies, I wanted to do something on the topic of ologies for almost twenty years, like fifteen it's years. Such a good idea. It's such a great name. Oh. It's such a. Mm. I wanted to, and I thought maybe I would do an illustrated book because I used to be an illustrator. Um, and I just kept saving it and saving it because I was like, oh, this idea is like so close to my heart. Um, I came across this list on the internet, you know, back when everything was, <laughs> I feel like things were GeoCities pages and, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like terrible fonts and stuff. And I came across this list and I was thinking, you know, for every ology, there's someone who does this or also wouldn't be an ology. So who is right. someone who is a cloud scientist? Like, what's their deal? And I always want to do something about it. And, um, and I, I kind of was so afraid to do it poorly that it took me forever to actually put it out. And I, I was really worried that scientists would think it was too simple and that lay people would think it was too complicated. And it turned out that, um, that scientists are way more willing to speak to lay people than I thought. And the fact that scientists listen to it blows my mind because I was afraid of exposing myself of not knowing enough, but um, it turns out scientists just know what they're into. Like a moon scientist doesn't know jack shit about turtles. And that's great, you know? Just and they love scientist. knowing that someone else has devoted their life to something that never occurred to them until this moment. Yes, and so yeah. there's this notion that like, if you're a scientist, you know everything about capital S science. And that's not true at all. So yeah, well, so it's been a great exercise in that. I mean, in, in in this very moment, and I'm not going to go too deeply into the politicization of science right now, but there is a way in which we culturally often separate ourselves from science, and we think of science as the non-emotional um, discipline. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that I said at the beginning of Mythbusters, I didn't think of myself as, I thought of science as something that smart people did, and I put that on the outside of a category I was in. Yes, me too. And I realized over the course of doing Mythbusters that science is as much an emotionally uh, gripping discipline for the practitioners of it. Not that emotion Mm -hmm. is part of the discipline, but they love it. And that's what binds us when we can talk about it. (laughs) It's so true. You wouldn't have people that are working this hard for so long if they didn't love it. Yeah. And that's the thing is science was, you know, I always remind myself and other people I try to, who don't think that they're into science. It's like, if you like flushing toilets you're into science if you like is so amazing you know what i mean (laughs) there's science in everything that's fluid dynamics right there like there's science in everything that we do and it's just um to take away that gate of this is science and we're into it and you are a lay person and you it's too complicated for you it's like what i love to do to make people realize that there's science and like the plant on their desk obviously and you know there's science in the way that their dog greets them there's science and everything so um so yeah it's just been it's been so great i've ended up with just a cliff clavin amount of random facts <laughs> in my brain <laughs> um, do you do you have one that you wish you could get rid of just because it's always showing up uh, you know, I think about how um, captive chimpanzees take human birth control. I think about that way more than I should. <laughs> and I think about how there are chimpanzees that are probably better at taking medication daily than I am. I, I forget my vitamins sometimes, you guys. You know, we all do. But yeah, I think about that a lot. Um Oh Have my you gosh. seen, by the way, yeah. there are medicine caps that now tell you how long it's been since the last time you opened that bottle. Oh, gosh. Wow. 
<laughs> Clearly, it's I'm actually, a little scattered. I, because I'm starting to forget really dumb shit uh, at 53. I'm like, I, I actually kind of might need that soon. <laughs> You know, I talked to a neurologist. I was interviewing a neurologist for uh, for my CBS job on Innovation Nation, and he was saying, or rather, a neuroscientist, pardon me, Dr. Um, David Eagleman, and he did uh, the brain on PBS. And he said, COVID brain is the thing. High stress situations, prolonged, uh, you know, isolation. He says he forgets things all the time. And I was like, as a neuroscientist. Is that normal? He's like, totally. It's we're we're under so much stress that our brains can't necessarily handle things. So if you were forgetting things, or say, for example, if you suddenly comes time to introduce yourself and you have no words that come out of your mouth on a podcast, <laughs> it's normal. Okay, it's normal. Um, <laughs> normal. I'm I'm curious. Uh, over here at Tested. Uh, mm -hmm. COVID has kept us all employed, but it's radically altered all of our procedures. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how, uh, how COVID has, uh, has changed yours. Oh, well, here's the thing. I travel, you know, you and I, we both travel a ton for work. Like, uh, and you're, you're so good at traveling. Like I've seen you, you have your savage bag, you have <laughs> like your two me luggage, you're like ready to go. Um, but I thought that traveling was why I maybe was a little bit um, frazzled all the time. And so when COVID hit, I was like, oh, well, this, I'll never be, I won't be frazzled because I, I won't be on airplanes. And then about a month into it, I was like, mm, still frazzled. So I think that that is something like just from a lifestyle perspective, you know, I'm still trying to figure out why do I still work 20 hours a day when, <laughs> like, why can't I put down my work? And, um, and so, yeah, so that, that's changed things a little bit. And, you know, I'm back to traveling, um, you know, under some, a lot of COVID precautions, yeah. you know, for work, we've got to get our season done. So that's not super fun. I don't yeah. love, you know, wearing latex gloves and five masks on a plane and then taking a, a Silkwood shower when I get into a Hampton Inn. That's not fun. No. <laughs> There's like nothing. Um, but yeah, but other than that, I think one thing that's made it a little bit easier, and I don't know how you feel about this, but um, so many of my interviews for ologies were in person. And so there were people that if I go to Australia, I'm definitely going to talk to this platypus expert. But yeah. now that that's not expected, I've ended up having more interviews with people that I probably would never have interviewed because oh, I had that cool. barrier. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting too. Um, I think it's also maybe galvanized people's uh, interest in science a little bit, or at least an administration that is science believing, you know, because it's yeah. one thing to be like, the world is flat, but it's quite another to be like, a virus doesn't exist. Like, those affect your life in very different ways. So I think that the public in the last four years particularly has become a little bit more taking it into their own hands to be like a champion for science. So I think that's made our jobs easier. I don't know about you. Like, do you find that the people who are into your are like, help us help science. <laughs> yeah, no, very yeah. much, very much so. I mean, I, you know, I have drifted sort of adjacent to science. I've drifted deeply into making an obsession, uh -huh. um, sort of YouTube externalization. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm getting that all the time. Uh, that people want to look, we need, we need a generation of digital natives and critical thinkers to, to, to and we need to leave them something to work with. <laughs> I know that's true. Uh, yes. An actual viable planet would be wonderful. But, um, but I think it, I think it has, I feel like there's more cheerleaders for science than, than ever, which is great. And I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing about it too, and I don't know how you feel about it, but it's really easy to be incredibly, um, obviously stressed out and uh, overwhelmed. And I think re helping people reconnect to things that uh, make them curious and happy can, can bring back a lot of energy, you know, yeah. um, just asking yourself, what am I really, really into? And you might find that you're <laughs> passionate about things that you're, that you've buried a little bit. So, and I've also loved to talk to so many scientists of color, um, so many scientists in the LGBTQ community, and it's been really great to hear, um, just hear their experience and, and, uh, and to kind of give them a voice or, or to give them a platform um, to, you know, 
to amplify that voice because there's so much going on that that scientists are at the forefront of. And oh so, my gosh. And, yeah. and I mean, I went down a rabbit hole a few months ago um, on Twitter of a uh, black in the ivory. Yes, I love that account. About, yeah. <laughs> just about accounts of being black in uh, in academia and th- that every single person of color in that thread had been told by someone at mm. some point in their career, you took a slot from a friend of mine. Oh God. Every single one had been told that directly. Yeah. It's there's, there's so much that I feel like we're living in an era where voices are, I think at least the digital era has democratized some, um, some ways of getting your story out and, and it's, yeah, it's, I think Twitter and Twitter and Instagram can be kind of like a, a bomb to people because they go there and just like, I'm just going to look at dog pics. I'm just going to look at, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to look at things that soothe my soul. But, um, what I've really loved about ologies is, um, I have gotten to follow so many people from guests that I've, I've had on that my timelines are, are a lot of social justice tweets yeah. that I'm really, really happy to get to read because it, those kinds of perspectives sometimes are filtered out of a lot of big media. So, um, so ologies is, yeah, ologies is, uh, opened my eyes to so much stuff and, and it's just, there's so many good voices out there. And there's so many people, by the way, who are like, I want to be the next Adam Savage and I want to be the next Bill Nye. <laughs> it's like, it's amazing how much, um, you know, how much the people who are doing science communication have inspired other people to be sci commerce too. And it's, you know, it's, I'm very clear. It's incumbent on me to pass on everything I know. I'm on the long slide down. <laughs> Here it's coming. I'm curious about the, uh, the realization that, um, that you seem to need a certain amount of manic energy to get your work done. Have you, have you, has your uh, uh, relationship to that adjusted over COVID or have you just illuminated it? I just want to say, as you've said this, can can you please show what just happened? <laughs> it's my boyfriend proving that we do have a sword in the house. <laughs> Heard you guys talking about sword. Oh, that makes me so happy right now. <laughs> this is actually got one. This is actually my sword. He gave this to me as a birthday gift six years ago because he that, knew. That's, that's he knows you. That's brilliant. That that's um. I needed a costume katana. Is this a katana? Yes. This is costume. Oh, oh yeah, my God. Great. This is just, just saying. We have one in the house. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you, my love. Allie's in the club, everybody. <laughs> in the club. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> um, one thing about one thing about my brain I've really begun to realize lately and literally within like the last couple of weeks, um, you know, getting to talk to a lot of people about like neurodiversity too. Yeah. It, with ologies and my boyfriend was diagnosed with ADHD when he was 32. So he went most of his life not knowing how his brain worked. Mm-hmm. And we dated off and on and we broke up a few times. We just, I'm older than him by like a lot of years. And so we thought like, like nine specifically. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we always were like, we're in different places, da, 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 da. but we always adored each other. And, um, but yeah, and he got diagnosed with ADHD and, to see the way that he, that helped him understand his own brain and it helped me understand his choices and uh, and just how he how he reacts to things and more and more I've started to realize oh I'm, we might have that in common a little bit <laughs> so yeah so yeah uh, yeah um, and so I think that there's something about um, you know, I'm such an excitable person that a lot of times I need that excitement to carry me through a project. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas other people might say, I work from seven in the morning, I'm off at four, and then I enjoy a decaffeinated beverage and I do my routine. And I'm a little bit more, I well, feel if, like childlike. <laughs> well, if we were to graph it, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is you prefer the higher spikes of excitement as you're building momentum. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> but yeah, I think that I, um, so yeah, I did. I, I talked to a doctor recently about it. He was like, we might want to, we might want to start you on something, but cause I think that for me, I've always been a super high achiever, but, um, the cost of me getting my work done is usually exhaustion and, you know, all nighters and, 
and all of that, because it's just like, it's how I get my brain to focus. And so, yeah, I'm learning a little bit about that, about my own brain. So yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one of my sons is diagnosed ADHD. Oh, and, really? And he got diagnosed by, a, 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 I think probably at the age of 12, 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it was just, as you said, super illuminating for us. One is there's so much you can realize you don't have to take personally. Yes. Oh my right? gosh. Like, yes. He's not doing this on purpose. This is just how he's processing. And once you understand that, it's just a, you know, we were joking that at one point it was like all the stuff issues we're having are simply because the schools require you to go through them in a certain way. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. smart as anybody. There's no problem. It's just about the approach to schoolwork that uh, we had to learn is totally different in his head. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I learned that with my boyfriend a lot too. One thing about ADHD that neither one of us knew until he was diagnosed is um, people with ADHD, and I can see this a little bit in myself as well, um, have rejection sensitivity, dysphoria. Have you heard of this? Oh, no, but that's oh nice. Gosh. I'm connecting to it immediately. Go ahead, explain <laughs> to me. So rejection sensitivity dysphoria is, uh, right I know, it's, it's, it's like extreme uh, clinical butt hurt is essentially, <laughs> it's like medically butthurt, um, where, where you feel really like, sl you know, like slighted or easily, mm -hmm. um, easily rejected. So if someone, you know, says, eh, yeah, not tonight, I kind of feel like staying in, someone with ADHD might interpret that as, you fucking hate me, they hate right. me, they don't want to hang out with me. And so the reaction some people with ADHD might have more extreme reactions of like, you sure you don't want to come out? You sure do you hate me? Da, da, da. And so, and that apparently is something that's also learned from like messing up of, you know, air quotes, messing up a lot in school or not having their homework and they get used to getting yelled at a lot. So they just are really sensitive to it. And learning that about, about in my relationship was like changed everything. Cause I just knew, I knew then, Oh, he might take this personally when he absolutely shouldn't. And so being right, able to couch right. that in, you know, hey, I I adore you. I'm just gonna stay in tonight. You know, pre COVID was very very helpful. So yeah, there's there's um there's things about brains that, and I do feel like uh, social media has helped a lot too. Following people who um who are really outspoken or communicators about you know uh, about uh, disability or neurodivergent uh, matters, like you start to get such a, a a better picture of how different everyone operates and how different we all are. And, and that is so helpful in accepting yourself. And Oh my and, God, so much, you know, I, this sure. is one thing that I feel has been really uh, beautiful to me during the lockdown among my social group is everybody I know has taken the tack of let's let everyone go at their own speed. <laughs> You don't want to hang out with me? That is totally cool. I don't take it personally. You don't want to be more than 20 feet away? Fine, too. That's cool. You don't want to hang out twice in a week? I am fine with that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I think that, um, I think also people who are communicators, too, and, you know, you have, you have such a great way, Adam. I've always loved how you have like incredible shock absorbers almost. You're like a car that's really, that has really good shock absorbers on camera where you can read a situation, I feel like, and know how to respond to get the energy back up or to have a serious question or to keep it going or put a button on it. You're so good at that. And I think that that takes a lot of reading other people's kind of signals and compensating and da, 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 da. And, um, and I think sometimes the cost of that can be, you know, it emotionally like reading into things people who are who are our hosts and are on camera you know we take those little signals sometimes <laughs> we are well super and I mean, that, 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 so part of one yeah one of the things that i have understood on lockdown as we're if we're if, as we're disclosing mm -hmm. uh, is that yeah there was some part of me that built a filter between impulse and reaction Mm -hmm. And built a filter that said, well, there's a right way to respond to everything. As long as I know the right way to respond to everything, I'll get it right. And then I'll, everyone will understand that I'm probably okay. Mm -hmm. And this filter, I ran between every impulse that came in. And so what you said earlier about what's the real question here or what am I really upset about? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, well, it's, I don't know if you've been in therapy, but... Mm -hmm. uh, in therapy, your therapist will sometimes say to you, come on, what are you really upset about? <laughs> and the answer is, you always know when they ask. 
I know. You always have an answer right at your disposal. And so I've started to ask that question to myself. What am I really upset about? And it turns out I always have an answer. And the answer is something that I often uh, uh, dismiss because of that filter. Mm-hmm. That there's a re- there's a right response, and my reaction isn't part of it, and I've I'm starting to collapse that space. Yeah, to discount your own um, emotions or reactions because you find them inappropriate is, is something that you're. I don't deserve to feel that way. Is is something that happens a lot, and um, I call that <laughs> I call that core gloom. Is um, when if like if my friend if or myself or my partner if something's wrong. And you're like, what's the matter? And I, I just blah, 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 blah. and you're like, what's the core gloom? And the core gloom is that like, yeah, someone didn't get back to me about something, or <laughs> I'm, you know, worried about this thing, or or it might, you know, I'm I'm worried about, you know, a family member who's sick, but instead I've piled a lot of stress about, you know, deadlines or something on top yes. of it. You know, so yeah, core gloom is like that like molten center of sorrow in you that you have to address. <laughs> We had one just a few weeks ago where I came home and my wife is like, everything okay? I'm like, yeah, everything's fine. She's like, I'm like, well, there was this thing I filmed and I didn't make the final cut. And And I'm not going to complain to anybody about what it was because who cares? My life is a fantasy. I really, I have so few complaints, but this one hurt and I'm a little sad about it right now. And I told her and only her Uh like, yeah, that sounds like that sucks. Oh, and she's a therapist, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm married to a therapist. I'm the son of a therapist. Yeah, we are. We're all about the talking cure in my family. <laughs> Unearthing the core gloom. <laughs> Get a little trowel in there. See what's underneath. I know. And a lot of times, yeah. And I, I have certainly found that lockdown has given us a little bit more time and space to sort of dig into our emotions. And I was a person who also before lockdown was constantly busy. I had a policy that if I would go to someone's funeral, if they died, I would go to their birthday party every year. Cause you do not deserve to go to a funeral and say, this is my really good friend. <laughs> if like you would have ditched out on their karaoke party, you know what I mean? Oh, like okay. you got to show up for people in life. So my my theory was if I would go to the funeral, I will not miss the birthday and I will be there with a balloon and I'll be there with a cupcake. And I always have candles in my purse because you never know when it's going to be like a crew member's birthday or someone's birthday. You know what I mean? Yeah. Keep a candle in your wallet. You'd be surprised how quickly you need it. But, um, and so I was always really busy with like, you know, jumping from the baby shower to this, to that. And so yeah. my time always was really filled um, because I never wanted to be a flake. And so it's really it's odd with lockdown to think, well, my, my schedule's cleared. Why isn't my brain clear? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, great. There's a lot of jumble and stuff in there, but, um, but yeah, it's been such an interesting, odd exercise. Um, and I feel like online, there was always this, uh, like trope, this meme that was people who never wanted to go to parties, like, ugh. I'm too tired to go to parties. And um, it's kind of extinguished FOMO in a way. Like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, uh, uh, many years ago, we were doing an episode uh, on Mythbusters about viscosity. And I ended up, I researched viscosity and discovered the field is called tribology. Mm-hmm. I found that there is an international association of tribologists and the yes. president had his phone number on the website. Oh. So I called him. And I was asking simply about an analog test that I could do on camera to demonstrate viscosity. Mm-hmm. And as I've described to you, I could hear a catch in his throat as, and I could hear him being annoyed at my question. Uh-huh. And I asked the second follow-up question and I could hear that it didn't make it better, it made it worse. Like he was getting more <laughs> activated by how wrong my, qu- my question was not even wrong, right? And then it turned out that what I didn't understand, what I fundamentally took me about half an hour of our conversation to understand is that viscosity is not a value. It's a relationship. Oh. It's a relationship between a liquid and its environment, its temperature, what air pressure it's under, what materials it is touching, et cetera. Uh-huh. And that's why your car has, your car oil has a viscosity of 1540. That's a bracket. Yes. Depending on the temperature and the activity, the viscosity is somewhere in there. And so that actually changed my whole way of thinking and talking to every other scientist since then. 
because really? I realized that each of these disciplines often includes a whole different way of seeing things. And mm -hmm. this is the longest way of asking you about yeah, some of this. the, maybe uh, some anecdotes about some of the ways in which interviews changed your way of understanding a whole field. Oh, man. I, okay, number one, I, well, I need to do a viscosity episode now, <laughs> like illuminating. And if it has an ology, like my ears have perked up and full, put that in a mental folder. Um, you know, one one episode that people talk to me a lot about is the fearology episode, mm -hmm. which is a real word. I found it in the literature once, but I found it in the literature. <laughs> so that counts. Um, and there's this uh, woman, Mary Poffinroth, and she's LA based and she is a fearologist. She did a TED talk on fear. She studies fear. And um, as someone with, you know, kind of, um, I, I mean, I'm like, a chihuahua when it comes to anxiety. I'm like, you know, I'm, I have very nervous chihuahua energy. Um, but she talked about how, how anxiety is really just fear. And typically the fear is that we're not good enough. And right. the idea of breaking down what we're afraid of and how the amygdala works, that was something that um, I get so many emails about that. And I think about that a lot when, when I am anxious about something or when I'm anxious about not doing a good job. And, um, I'm working uh, right now. I'm consulting on a show called uh, Ada Twist for Netflix, mm -hmm. and we were talking about about a character's motivation for something. And uh, I mentioned that I mentioned that fear episode about how anxiety is just this fear of not being good enough, <laughs> and and they ended up kind of incorporating that a little bit in a storyline. Um, and it's one of those things where anything that helps me understand brains better is something that is in my back pocket all the time. But yeah, just, just that asking yourself, yeah, what you're afraid of. That's, that's huge for me. And then also I had Dr. Katie Mack on who was a cosmologist and talked about, uh, about sudden death of the universe. And I, I always follow just her on Twitter. I love Katie Mack. Uh, amazing. I think that might be where the, um, where the slogan of just cut bangs, text your crush, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, I been... actually, I listened to that fearology episode and I remember hearing the penny drop in while you were talking to them, you were like, oh, you're like, I could hear you being like, I never occurred to me. I could look at it like this. Yes. Yeah. And it's, sorry, I just had to draw my sword. Um, yeah. It's funny because she came over and, uh, and, I mistook the time. So she came over. I was not prepared. I had my tax paperwork everywhere. It was hot. <laughs> and I was just just sweating and nervous. And it was funny because all of that was fear of not being good enough. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think that one thing that Ologies has also taught me that I feel like I, I hear over and over again is, is um, yeah, we're all just going to die. So just do whatever. You might as well just <laughs> You know, I, there's so many ways to die, you guys. Oh, boy. Wow. Are there? You know what I mean? And now I kind of want to be turned into a skin book. What do you think? Would you want your skin to be a book? Uh, it depends on the book. Well, okay. I mean, it heavily I, depends upon the book. <laughs> not like, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> like, so like, Sweet Valley High. Woody Bloom is not a terrible choice. No, no. True, true, true. Um, <laughs> I feel like, okay, what if it were, what if it were like a memoir or of your own. Yeah. Like a Jackie I, Collins book. <laughs> it, it would, uh, I love books. I, I, I mm -hmm. have actually replicated, I haven't done a show and tell on this, but I replicated Indiana Jones Grail Diary a, a bunch of years ago. And I like learned book binding to stitch together all the signatures. And yeah, it was a whole thing. Um, and I, I still love weathering books as props, and I love what books represent as objects. So I love the idea of being a science book of, of yeah, by all means, I would totally do that. Yeah, you couldn't work on it, though, because uh, you'd be dead. Well, I mean, they could certainly use some of my tattoos for the legends in the book. Oh, my God. <laughs> See, I mean, I feel like you're not using it anymore, you know? Jeez. Exactly. What am I going to do with it? But yeah, I've, I've thought more because I did, a, I did an episode on, um, on body farms as well. Oh and yeah. That was the osteology episode. And so I think I've thought of myself returning to the earth more than I had before. I did a thanatology episode yeah. and, uh, and so I, but I just did one about anthropodermic biocodicology, which is the study of whether or not a book is made with human skin. 
I know there's an ology for everything. And so, um, <laughs> and so I interviewed Dr. Daniel Kirby and Megan Rosenblum, who just wrote a book about this called Dark Archives. And I interviewed them about them going into archives and, and studying these rumored skin books and who did them. And oftentimes they were made by doctors without consent. Um, but they, it would be interesting. There's one, okay, so one guy uh, yeah. bound his memoirs with his own suede and gave a copy to someone who was his foe, who then became a good friend. Human suede's a thing, by the way. <laughs> Human suede, one of the worst uh, bands from the 80s. Human suede. <laughs> Human suede and the Scotch Guards. I don't know. How much Scotch Guard would you need? What if you that got wet? You don't want to ruin it? You spent all your whole life growing that thing. You kidding me? This guy protected. Can you so, imagine making a wrong cut? Oh, oh man. Measure twice please <laughs> exactly. Cut once but he, this guy was like hey when i die use my skin make a book give it to someone who was my foe and tell him he he did a great job he was a great adversary and um but yeah so this idea of like well if i ever wrote a book might as well bound it in that you know sitting around have that sit on a shelf is there an ologies book coming? I, the world oh needs God. an ologies book. Ugh, I always feel so under, I feel so underqualified. I, I, I know that's. I, I wrote a book. If I wrote a book, you can totally <laughs> write a book because I am super underqualified with a high school <laughs> diploma to do such a thing. Would you have your book bound in your skin? A hard copy? Oh my. <laughs> Would you do I it? Think about that one. Think about it. <laughs> Just, I mean, my will is written on a post-it note in my filing cabinet. I should not. I'm now. I'm going to be putting it somewhere else for any <laughs> marauders. But um, yeah, I one day I, I was like, oh, I don't really have a will. I should get this actually notarized. But I just apparently I've written will in your hand is is legal. It is. It but, is. Um, so yeah, I got to add. Make me into a book. But I I don't know. I was thinking about making. I've always wanted to make ologies as a book, and then I ended up making it as a podcast. But I think um, I would love to write a book. Is my point. And I wanted to do actually narratology for November because it's NaNoWriMo, like write a book in a month. Have you heard of that? NaNoWriMo? I have heard that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where you, you write a novel in a month. And so I was, I wanted to do that in October. That way people could get started in November, but I do spooktober every year full of bones and spiders and stuff. And so, yeah. Yeah. So maybe next year, because the scariest thing, more scary than spiders and bones is probably writing a book. So maybe I should do narratology as part of Spooktober because what could be more terrifying than pouring your heart out on a page and then putting your heart on a shelf to be like, does anyone want it? And then watching where it charts in the New York Times. What I, could be more terrifying than that? I, I used to know someone who didn't like painting paintings, even though it's what she wanted to do because she was terrified of being like 70 and running into one of her paintings at a garage sale. For oh, I've, I have had the exact fear. And I, I, was, I was a painter too for a while. I, I sold my paintings in like, you know, coffee shops and online and stuff. And this idea of the moment that someone has your painting and they go and they Marie Kondo it, that <laughs> moment, that thing where they touch it and go, does not spark joy. That moment is like, I feel like if I ever have like a, like a, an itch or a twinge in my neck. That's what's happening be, at that moment. Yeah. Like an angel getting its, what's the opposite of an angel getting its wings. It's just like it's a, a goose painting. walking over your grave. Yeah. Yes. A painting getting its condo. It's like, <laughs> Just the idea. But yeah, so I completely get that. I mean, that's what's so interesting is we are able to leave legacies more so now than ever before, where um, I think about that with Twitter a lot. You can tell post-election, I've spent some hours on Twitter. You guys, <laughs> My brain is like in the Twitter language. Yeah. Back when I used to play Magic the Gathering, my brain would think in uh, how much mana I'd have to tap in order to go brush my teeth. So like my brain thinks in the currencies, but... Um, but yeah, one thing about Twitter is, um, you know, we think about if you had ancestors who, uh, lived through world war II, and, um, if you could go back and read their daily thoughts during regimes and during oppression, and if you could go back and read all of your ancestors thoughts during times of, and there's never, I feel like there's never a time on earth that isn't a time of intense conflict. Yeah. Um, but if you could go back and read their stance on it, um, and would you be proud of them or not? And, um, or whose side would they take? Would they, would they fall on the right side of history? And so I feel like 
you know, sometimes with Twitter and, and with using our voice and with using our art and with making our paintings and with writing our books, we're so afraid of being judged in the present of not being good enough. But just think of people who come after you judging your silence. You know, that is something that I feel like is more damning and is more of a tragedy uh, than ever being judged as not good enough, you know? And it's the gift you can give the future generations of of your voice and your point of view that they may better understand what you went through and that gives them perspective of what they're going through. Because right. that's all we're doing is sharing perspectives, right? Right, exactly. So I think like no, knowing that and also for ologies, I'm, I'm kind of open about how I tinkered with ologies for well over a year after I started my first interviews. I just didn't want to not do it justice. And I still work too too much on it because I love it so much and I want to do every episode justice, but I was so afraid to put it out and have it fail. And I just think like my life would suck if I didn't make ologies. Like it has gotten so much better. <laughs> and so I remember when I first met you, I met you in January, 2017. I didn't put the podcast up until uh, September. And so I remember about it while we were traveling. I yeah. remember you mentioned it. Yeah, I rang, I wrung my hands to nubs, you know, worrying about it. And do the thing. It's always do the thing. And that's always one thing that the thing. scientists tell me that over and over again, too, is like, fail, 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 fail. That's when you learn that's how you get better is just, uh, just jump in the game and fail. So I think about that all the time of just, okay. Life is iterative. It is. It is. I mean, imagine if they never put out the iPhone because it was, it wasn't a 12. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, we'd never get, we'd never get to 12. We'd never get to all kinds of weird, deep fake face filters if we hadn't had the first touch screen in our pockets. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, that has encouraged me so, so, so much. So yeah, I feel lucky to do it. Well, Ali, I think that is a wonderful place to stop. And I noticed that us two gingers have kept Norm from speaking for pretty much the entire podcast. I've enjoyed listening. I love it. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> um, Ali, apologies and everything that you do is so inspiring. I'm so glad you do it. And I'm so proud to know you. And I just, I think the world of, of, of what you're doing and I want to support it in any way that I can. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Big, big, big fan. Obviously too giddy. Big hugs. <laughs> big, big, big hugs. Stay safe down there in Los Angeles. I shall. I shall. I'll keep some more company for you. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye-bye.